Today, we're going to talk about design for additive manufacturing, specifically for composite printers uh, from Mark Forged. Uh, my name is Marcus Brown. I'm, my background is in mechanical engineering, mechanical design. Uh, I've been doing SolidWorks for my whole career uh, and uh, been in 12 years with MLC CAD. And I'm really jumping a lot into the additive manufacturing because it's such a powerful new tool for designers. So the agenda today, what we're going to go through is talk a little bit about design for additive manufacturing and how it is becoming a very new and very valid manufacturing method that you need to consider adding to your repertoire of manufacturing abilities. Just like machining, forging, injection, molding, casting, you know, we understand these intuitively. Uh, additive manufacturing really needs to be added to that list. And I think a lot of people don't really fully understand what that looks like or how that goes. Then we'll talk about some considerations and some design approaches. Again, I think a lot of people are really uh, aware and ready to uh, work with or to kind of uh, understand design for additive manufacturing uh, or approaches for more traditional production methods. But when it comes to additive manufacturing, there's some really cool tricks that you can use that I think are going to really help you out. Then we're going to talk about some best practices. Um, some of these are pretty standard, but there's some cool tricks that uh, they're not hard to learn, but they are slick as all get out. And I think you're really going to like kind of some of these just approaches that if you've not been around a lot of 3D printing, you maybe didn't know about. And then I've got four designs that I want to go into more detail and kind of discuss the thought processes and basically reinforce what we've talked about so far. Uh, the idea being, in, with the design challenge in front of you, this is how I would mentally go through the thought process of design with additive manufacturing in mind. So the first thing I want to talk about is that you have, as designers, as manufacturers, you have a set of manufacturing methodologies already in your brain, right? And you can look at a design and say, that should be blank, right? So that should be forged, that should be machined, that should be injection molded. And if the part or the design doesn't fit one of those standard ideas, we almost intuitively, our gut just rejects it and says, that's a terrible design. You can't do that. Well, I'd like to kind of explore these methodologies and propose adding one more. So let's talk a little bit about each one that we know about. These are not new, but for example, for injection molded parts, uh, you've always got to have draft on the faces, right? It's a design constraint. You want the walls to be uniformly thin so that they're, uh, so that they're basically uh, uh, going to shrink uniformly and work well. Uh, if you have undercuts or any other kinds of uh, slides or anything, the cost is going to go way up in the tooling, which then has to be offset by quantity. And with just a few exceptions where you're maybe doing overmolding, you've got to pick one material and then it's got to be solid, solid throughout. And we just assume that that's just how things work because it is, right? One material, that's what you're going to get. Talk about forging, right? Forging has a lot of similarities with injection molding uh, where you're going to have to have some draft. Uh, but you also got to think about the raw material, right? What's the, the base material and uh, does that need to be maintained or how are you going to form it from the original to the final shape? It's got to have drafted face, it's got to have rounded corners, and fine detail is definitely not something you're going to see in a lot of forgings, or at least a lot of times you don't see that in a forging. With CNC machining, Right? You're talking about round internal corners. You're talking about more operations adding cost. You know, If you add operations on multiple faces, that means you're either going to have to chuck it up multiple times or you're going to have to chuck it up into a more expensive machine like a 5-axis to get it to run. And you've got to pay attention to stock size and shape. Right, If you're going to be removing 80% of the mass in machining operations, then you're going to be spending a lot of money both on material and on time on that machine to get it going. Uh, with welded parts, right, it's got to start with a standard shape and then it's going to work its way through it. The more add, welds you add, uh, the more uh, cost that's going to be added. You've got heat affected zones. Nobody complains about this, but a lot of times when I talk about 3D printing, people complain, well, 
It's not perfect, right? It doesn't do everything I want. Well, these aren't perfect either. 3D printing and additive manufacturing is not a perfect manufacturing technology. There's no such thing. Don't expect 3D printing to break that rule and to be perfect. Understand its limitations, work around them, and embrace them in a lot of ways because there's some really fantastic capabilities. And there's a few of them that they're not that bad. And in fact, there's some really uh, easy ways to work around them. So what are the expectations, the restrictions, the rules that apply to additive manufacturing? And how do we kind of relate that to the information we already know? Well, what I find is the, you know, additive manufacturing is pretty flexible. You can take just about any part and usually you can print it. But there's four main considerations that I find that most people, especially people that didn't get educated on design and engineering in the last five to 10 years, there's four considerations that just mentally you have a block on. So for example, uh, uniform solid material, right? The solid material of just about anything has to be uniform. If it's steel, it's solid steel. You wanna change the shape, you change the outside shape, but inside, it's solid. There's no options there, right? Um, well, with additive manufacturing, you can do sparse fill, right? It can be thick here and thin here. It can also have fiber reinforcement to where you actually get to choose uh, the, the density and it sort of creates like a Nomex, you know, aircraft panel where the inside is very, very open and soft, but the top and the bottom are extremely strong and hard. Um, that is a really cool feature that you can do and it's sort of like saying okay I want to pick aluminum or I want to pick steel because I need strength. Well if you're going with a composite part you can actually have a sliding scale that goes all the way from kind of a soft plastic part to a really strong structural steel part. Stock shape considerations when we build things, when we design things those things almost inevitably end up being sort of built around the original shape of the stock material. Anything that's got a really weird shape, like really long, but it's got a fat end on one side, that's just inefficient. Just intuitively, we think about it as being inefficient. But with additive manufacturing, there is no stock shape. In fact, there's no stock material to keep in stock. You just take spools of material and you make whatever you want. And so where you might have had multiple things assembled or you might have built it a certain way or it's always been built a certain way, you may be able to kind of challenge that and come up with some interesting new approaches. For shape restrictions, right, you can do fine detail with 3D printing. You can also do undercuts and hollow tubes and some crazy stuff. Um, you do have to worry about the orientation for uh, the finish and the supports and things like that. Uh, but shape restrictions kind of go out the window down to the point where you have, let's say, a, uh, a, a very small feature. Then you start to get to the resolution of the print head. And so there are some restrictions there we'll discuss. And then the cost, right? With machine parts, with uh, welded parts, with, you know, a lot of uh, uh, processes, the cost formula will change dramatically based on how many operations are needed, based on if there's going to be finishing operations or grinding or, or, or uh, painting or whatever. With 3D printing, those mostly go away. You're not programming anything complicated. You're not buying material. You're not finishing it. You're not welding it. You just throw it on and go and you're done. So if it's a big part with a lot of material, it costs a lot. If it's a small part without a lot of material, it costs very little and that's a much more linear uh, uh, thing. It tends to start out a little higher on the per part cost uh, than a, let's say, injection molded part would, but you're able to do the first one and the last one for basically the same price. It's pretty cool. So let's continue to think about this idea that you're gonna think differently about design when you add additive manufacturing as an option, right? Let's think about an optimal design. So down here at the bottom of the screen, I've got this original model that I want to optimize. And I say, okay, I'm going to use what's called topology optimization. 
And with topology optimization, you block it out. You idealize the overall shape requirements. And then the software, and it's, it's pretty expensive software, but it's really powerful, goes through and it finds the best shape, the best external shape to, to build that part. And without computers and without additive manufacturing, that would be a terrible design. But because we have computers, we know that's actually very efficient. And because we have additive manufacturing, that creates a very uh, uh, makeable part out of, uh, let's say, steel or aluminum. But what if we stopped early? What if we backed this up and said, I've got a model and I want to make it uh, out of a composite? This block shape, if it's got sparse fill, if it's got fiber reinforcement, that block shape itself could theoretically be um, just as strong and lightweight as this optimized part. And the big assumption, again, is that you have a uniform solid material. If you assume that you have a uniform solid material, then the only way to change the shape or change the, the weight or change the strength or anything else is by changing the exterior shape. You just don't ever think about changing the interior shape, right? So if you can change the interior and the exterior shape and density, suddenly you don't have to optimize the topology. You could actually optimize a block, which is pretty crazy. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times we think, well, in order to build an efficient part that's strong, we're going to need to use steel. We're going to need to use heavy metals. But if you use composite, you can make a big blocky design that's chock full of carbon fiber that's just as strong as that steel part and requires basically no real effort to perform the design work on. Right, so uh, with manufacturing, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, these restrictions and assumptions that are made are really hard to kind of get out uh, from underneath you. Um, so for this one, you know, if you don't assume that the only way to lose weight is by changing the exterior shape, it opens up new possibilities. If you assume that you can use s s uh, softer or lighter materials you then kind of change how you would even approach it from the beginning. And sparse fill designs are very easy and lightweight to mill, build. Let's keep going. Let's talk about uh, some other new approaches that I think people don't do a lot of. And it's because the other manufacturing approaches aren't conducive to it. But these approaches are extremely conducive to additive manufacturing. And there's all kinds of tricks that people use. People that are doing uh, injection molding, right? They always use certain tricks. All the injection molder uh, designers know these tricks. Well, here's a few tricks for you to think about with additive manufacturing. So let's talk about hybrid models. Hybrid involves taking something super cheap, like a, a metal pin or a bolt or a, a, a piece of bar stock, a hex bar, something and incorporating it into this design. So these are some jaws, and there's these little metal dowels in there, and those are the wear surfaces. That's where the part is going to wear, and if this thing wears out, you can literally pop those out, stick some new ones in, and keep on using that jaw. The reason I think a lot of people don't use this type of approach is because in the real world, things just don't naturally fit together. To get two parts, two off-the-shelf parts to fit together, they either have to be designed that way, like they're threaded, or like an 80-20 is everything's designed to go together, or you have to cope it, weld it, grind it, clean it, whatever, right? Putting parts together gets expensive. But when you control all of the information on one side of that equation, when you can build any shape you want using an additive printer, you can work around any off-the-shelf parts. Commercial off-the-shelf parts are usually really powerful, really strong, and uh, cheap, super cheap. So you're sort of building the value around those parts, right? Uh, common issues, the most common ones I see where the, uh, an off-the-shelf hybrid uh, design is really gonna help you out is when you have a problem with surface hardness or abrasion, right? Steel parts and aluminum parts, a lot of times it's not the strength you need, it's the, the abrasion resistance, right? Well, put a piece of steel rod or bar or sheet into the part, and suddenly it has a nice wear surface that's super cheap and lightweight. 
uh, strength, especially tension in the Z. I'm going to show you some examples, some tricks where you don't have to sort of uh, give up the strength in the Z if you need to have structural Z axis tension on your part. And then large size. So very much like 80-20, right? 80-20 brackets are very small. But then you use these really long tubes to make really large uh, systems. So think about something where you're building the, the building blocks or the connectors, and you use these off-the-shelf uh, pieces and parts and shapes to quickly build what you're needing. Here's another approach, another thought that is less necessary oftentimes in other manufacturing methodologies. And that is modularizing or making multi-body parts for your designs. So this part, this part is, uh, is structural, it's bolted at the bottom, and it's got kind of a cradle at the top offset uh, from the orientation of that base. 3D printing is going to have a hard time building this in one piece because of that z-axis orientation and the strength and the shape of this part. But if you build this as two parts, suddenly you can take that top part and lay it down, print them both much quicker than you could have printed the original because it's not so top high and, and, and uh, unsupported. But also, in addition to being faster to print, you could print in some cavities for bolts and for fasteners or for uh, mating faces to have it work together. And that specific detail and density doesn't give you, or detail and shape, uh, interlocking shape, doesn't really offer any sort of uh, cost uh, burden. And so with multi-body parts, uh, you can think about parts where... Uh, and it seems like I always run into these where you've got a part where the feature, the part is 99% of the time is being used for this primary purpose. But you put in all this extra time and effort and sometimes even cost to make it apply to or uh, address that last 1%, that oddball customer, that one extra variant that nobody really needs. If you make it a multi-body and you do the high volume stuff using traditional manufacturing methods, you could come in and sort of bolt on or strap on just the variant that you would need to allow for accommodations, right? So you would use high volume manufacturing technology, but then you would supplement it with those oddball shapes. Um, you could almost think of it like, uh, you know, a drill that has drill bits or that has uh, 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 bits for drivers. Right, each one of those is going to be different than the other ones, and you're probably going to come up with some weird torques or something else that comes along. Well, that drill bit, we knew that bit or that driver bit would need to be replaced, and so it was built so that the drill and the bit are separate. Think about that in terms of additive manufacturing, where additive manufacturing could be used to create those bits to create whatever crazy thing you want. Multibody can also help you to uh, overcome some size limitations, stress orientation such as this one, uh, print speed, support requirements. By making multibody, you can really put put uh, uh, take a lot more control over the design uh, without having to spend more on tooling. Where let's say you're buying three or four or five tools to build multibody, whereas if you built it out of one injection molded tool, for example, uh, you could save some money. Well, tooling is less of an issue here. The inverse of that is merging bodies. So how many times have you taken apart some kind of a plastic device, right? And you open it up and it's got like seven pieces that all slot together, and feed together, bolt together, screw together, and it just sort of collapses on you when you open it up. And you have problems with rigidity and stiffness because it's made of a whole bunch of little pieces. One of the classic examples, and one of probably the most powerful example for the Metal X, was this assembly where it has an internal channel. So if you look on that part, the left to the right, that is kind of a looping channel where it's recirculating some ball bearings. It's under heavy, heavy load, and because obviously it's got this weird internal shape, this had to be made out of multiple pieces but it has this other intersecting bore, which makes it even more difficult. So um, they replace this multi-piece thing that they can never withstand the, the forces 
with a single part that was previously otherwise unmanufacturable. But by merging them together, they reduced all the complexity, reduced the assembly cost, and actually strengthened the part because there weren't those mating faces to put together, right? A lot of times people have assemblies of a whole bunch of parts and they just assume that that's how it has to be made because that's how it's always been made. Well, think about it. the next time you've got a bunch of parts that go together and it's like, man, you gotta stick them all together in a weird way. Think about if you, there's maybe a way to build it such that more features are built into one piece as opposed to it being a lot of small pieces all kind of stacked on top of each other. So uh, uh, another really quick example would be, let's say you had a, a plastic part and it had some like indentions on the side. You'd either have to build two pieces and then put them together, or you'd have to build a tool that had slides to accommodate that shape. Both of those are gonna be more expensive, but if you could just skip the tooling completely, depending on your quantity, you could probably make it much better using additive manufacturing. The big takeaway I want you to have here is when you're faced with a challenging design, whether it is something that you just can't find a way to make it quickly or reliably, or you can't find it a way to make it cheaply, or you can't make a way to find it where it's strong enough, back up and challenge those design assumptions. 3D printing and additive manufacturing is a really complex and complicated thing, and there's tons of technologies out there. Not all of them are gonna be right for you. Some of them are still way too expensive. But if you could eliminate an entire design challenge off your plate and offload it to additive manufacturing, you might just find that this is way closer to our reality or actually kind of a no-brainer, more so than you even realized. But you kinda gotta get your brain right before you get there. I hope that uh, made sense. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that kind of discussion. Let's kind of jump into some more sort of best practices, right? Uh, some general information for additive manufacturing. So orientation, overhangs, and supports. Orientation is the big one. When you are adding layers one layer at a time, the orientation of the part is going to be very critical because that sets not only the z-axis direction, which then kind of orients all the uh, the layers. It also has uh, the 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 accuracy in the x y is going to be much better. The fiber reinforcement has to be an x y orientation. Um, so you're really going to be setting the orientation first, very much like a a cast or a, a or a, I'm sorry, a forged or a, a injection molded part. You do kind of have to make some decisions up front, then you've got to look at the support material because anything that overhangs is going to need support. So on this part, this handle, you can see that anything that's kind of horizontal requires support underneath it to hold it up. It doesn't require it down here at the bottom left corner because that's more vertical. That's actually okay. That can do that. And you can kind of consider rotating this around. For a part like this, it's got some holes in it. If you keep those holes in the z-axis, that's going to give you the most accurate shape in that uh, cross-section. So then you kind of got to just live with the other things. So it's, it's a trade-off and you've got a lot of flexibility there to work with. So some other things to think about in terms of, besides just trying to minimize support material, maximize the, the accuracy of the most critical features, uh, would be surface finish. So uh, the bottom, where it touches the plate, the, the build plate, is going to be very flat and smooth because you're smashing it up against that smooth surface. Vertical sides are going to give you the best surface finish. Swarf sides, which is kind of up here at the top where it's barely not flat, it's going to really kind of uh, uh, exaggerate those layer lines. So if that's visual, you will have to come in and uh, either sand that down or something like that. And then same with support material where you remove that. That, that, uh, that support material underneath here that area, or that, that stuff just kind of breaks off. It's just kind of real uh, fragile, just kind of uh, almost like an air filter uh, shape. And you just kind of rip it off, and it comes right off. But there might be just tiny little bumps there that, again, you may just need to hit it uh, real quick to kind of clean that up. So you set your orientation, and everything else is going to be kind of set around that. 
some other considerations with that orientation are things like holes and channels. So if you need to make a hole and it needs to be accurate, it needs to be super round, right? Concentricity, roundness is important, accuracy is important. Make the hole in the Z direction because anything that goes sort of up and down is going to have to be um, subject to the layer height. So the layer height uh, uh, and anything that might sort of sag on an overhang, uh, you want to keep your, your, your holes in the z-axis for accuracy if accuracy is important. Minimum feature size, there is this, this composites design guide. It's kind of down here at the bottom left. Uh, this is a, a picture of it. It's like 15 pages, and it's literally chock full of guidelines for things like minimum feature size. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but if you're gonna emboss lettering, let's say on the side of a part, and you want it to be really thin, you would go in here and look at the minimum embossed feature size in each orientation, and you would size your letters and size your features according to how the machine can accommodate that because it's going to round up or it's going to round down or it's going to miss it completely if you violate these minimum sizes because it just the, the resolution simply can't get there. A uh, couple other cool things uh, we can build uh, channels. So I could, I could put inside of a part, I could put like a, a, a channel that kind of snakes around inside, starts out in one part and comes out somewhere completely different, and it's got this nice, you know, watertight uh, uh, channel. The problem is, if you use a regular circle, that's going to have a horizontal part on top, and it's going to require support underneath. And you won't be able to get it out because it's hollow internal. So what you can do is where you know there's going to be draft, you can either add a chamfer or kind of create a little peak in there. So over down here at the bottom right, see this uh, this draft analysis is showing where the uh, supports are going to be needed. Where those are, I can just add a chamfer or cut it out or something like that, and it's going to completely eliminate the need for support, which means it prints faster and easier and cleaner, and it's ready to be used right away. Now, the other thing about this is a lot of times people will look at this like this chamfer. So I've got an overhang, and it's a horizontal overhang, and you say, well, if you put that chamfer in there, look how much more material you need. And that would be true if these were, let's say, welded shapes or something like that. But this is a sparse fill part. And you're going to have thicker walls than you will in the sparse fill area. This part below is not only better for additive manufacturing, but it's also probably going to be lighter weight than, than the, the one above, just because of the shape. So there's a lot of little silly things like that, that uh, if you do these little things up front, it's going to save you time, it's going to make your part better and easier to print, um, and they, they kind of all follow some pretty simple uh, design tricks. Fiber reinforcement is something that Mark Forged has done for a long time. It's, it's kind of revolutionized the market. And uh, the continuous fiber reinforcement, uh, if you've ever uh, seen parts like at a Mark Forge show or something like that, that are and that are not fiber reinforced, you're blown away when you get to hold on to them and, and play with them and see how much stronger it is when it has a continuous fiber reinforcement. I mean, it's just exponentially stronger, and you get to the part where uh, these things feel like and have the rigidity of and the strength of metal parts, even though they're made of composite nylon. So with the fiber reinforcement, you can do it around all the walls and the holes, uh, basically like a, like a really crazy aircraft panel where all the walls and surfaces are reinforced, but then it's more or less hollow where there's not much else going on. If you've got more torsional requirements, or maybe you've got, you need like a flat, strong shelf to kind of carry some load, you can do entire layers, and you get to choose uh, in the Iger setup how you know what strategy to use. If you create full layers, and it'll by default create them in groups of like three, it will then create oriented panels, and it'll orient the strands offset from each other to create a kind of a layup weave. Um, and it just does that automatically, naturally, and it does a fantastic job of creating super strong panels where 
you can set these reinforcements up specifically to take stress in a certain way. Uh, the Mark Forged Composite Design Guide has some really cool examples, but when you're dealing with this, what you can kind of think of is how stresses are being transferred through the part, and then just try to make sure that you reinforce those areas to create those layers. Um, we're going to explore that a little bit in some of the examples that are coming up. Threaded parts. Uh, with threaded parts, you, uh, you definitely have some issues with threads on most all additive manufacturing approaches. Threads just are kind of a problem. And the main issues I find are pull strength, durability, orientation of the threads, and then cost. And there's, depending on the size you have and what your needs are, I find that there's four main approaches to putting threads in parts. If the part thread is a quarter 20 or M8 uh, or above, you know, a much thicker, coarser thread or a larger thread, it is possible to print those threads. The strength and the success of it is going to be very dependent on what you do. So if you make bottle threads or acne threads or something like that uh, really coarse, you're going to have much better success in general than trying to make a fine thread. Uh, I actually found out somebody recently did one where they changed the thread shape and it eliminated the need for support. And so by setting the angle on their thread form, their thread shape, they created a custom non-standard thread that did a nice job in the printer. Uh, if you're going to do printed threads, Z-axis orientation is going to give you your best, be your best results, but it is possible to do them in other orientations. Captive hardware, this is definitely my favorite thing to do with a Mark Forge printer because you're talking about nuts or bolts, usually nuts, and they're extremely strong and extremely cheap. And so the, the idea is you just create a little opening for the nut and then drop it in either after the print is over or have it pause, put the nut in the part, and then it'll, it'll literally print over and seal that thing in completely so it's completely captive inside there. It can't come out without destroying the part, but that makes it super strong. Problem is those orientations uh, kind of limit you to either Z orientation or XY orientation, which it's most parts, but there's going to be situations where that won't work. So that's when you start looking at heat set inserts. So for the heat set inserts, they give you durable thread uh, at any orientation, but you do have to kind of make sure you get your hole just right uh, so that it can be assembled and give you a really nice solid uh, uh, attachment. Uh, we did a, a, a video online of uh, conformal uh, jaws, and we're going to explore that a little bit later, but we used unit testing to find out the best way to build it. And what that means is I, I, I took that shape and I broke it out and I tried to find the best combination of hole size for that insert that would give me the best result and would make it the easiest to do. I'll show you about uh, unit testing in a second. And then if you don't want to go to the expense of either modeling the threads or throwing in captive hardware, it is possible to just throw in a straight hole. And what I've, what I've done before is just use more or less a tap drill size and cut a hole in my part and print it with that straight hole and then just use plastic uh, screws or wood screws or thread forming screws and run them in. They're not going to be as strong, obviously, as a machine screw would be, uh, but they're cheap. You can put them in any orientation and they're going to get the job done for, let's say, a cover or something like that. So these are four different approaches that you can do uh, using a MarkForge printer to put threads in your part if you need to use threads. Unit testing, I talked about this a little bit. Imagine a part where you have, let's say, interference fit or a, or a slide fit or a friction fit. And with a machine part or with an injection molded part, you've figured out what tolerances to use to make that fit really good. Well. Additive manufacturing and 3D printing has a different surface finish, and it kind of creates the final design and shape a little different. And when you're talking about thousands of an inch, you may get a slightly different fit than what you're expecting. So if you're not sure how things are going to fit together, 
what you should do is take the design, take the feature of that design and cut that feature out and print that feature by itself. And if you've got some ideas, let's say, you know, one person says, I think you need to undersize it by two thou. The other person says, I think nominal will get you there. And the other person says, no, you need a five thousandths clearance. You say, you know what, we'll print all three and then we'll sit there side by side and check them out. The beauty of it is you get to test that really quickly on a part that's really small. You don't have to build the whole thing. And then once you pick the one you want, you know it's going to reliably translate to the other part because it's the same manufacturing process. So unit testing is something that uh, is a really cool thing. You just never really think about, hey, can I just build just that one piece and have it here today so I can make some decisions, right? It really uh, gives you a lot of confidence moving forward. If you have questions, feel free to throw them in uh, and let me know, and I'll kind of address those as we go. But what I want to do now is go through some examples. And these examples, I chose these specifically to kind of expand your mind and kind of push you to some places uh, to, to really think about how you would approach designing for additive manufacturing. So let's jump over to SolidWorks and kind of start talking about some of these. So a really common thing, and this is kind of the bread and butter for uh, Mark Forged printers, is the idea of using it for tooling. And so this right here, these jaws were created uh, specifically for this needle bearing. I needed to hold it. The bearing itself is kind of this really weird shape. Uh, it's certainly, you know, possible to clamp it up in a more traditional way, but to accurately locate that bore, right, we've got quite a bit of weird shape here that would require some fixtures. So by simply building this uh, in 3D printed parts with a manufacturer, like with a composite, I could build a very durable set of jaws. I could, could formally match the shape perfectly. I can't make jaws like this on a CNC machine, or if you can, you're certainly not going to make them very cheap and easy, and you only need one at a time, so it's not like you're going to be spending a lot of time working out uh, how to optimize the design on this. These are super lightweight, right? This is a composite uh, uh, onyx, which is nylon with chopped carbon fiber, and I can add some carbon fiber in here to kind of give it some rigidity throw in a couple carbon fiber shelves to kind of, or, or even just composite fiberglass shelves to kind of give it some rigidity and strength so that even when this clamps up, it's going to hold really tight and secure. And because it's this perfect shape, I'm going to very accurately locate it. Now, this one, I more or less just took my part, built two blocks and subtracted them, then cleaned it up to where this guy, what I do is bring the, uh, the part in here and I drop it in vertically, and it just fits perfectly in this geometry here. And then I can just kind of close it up and grab it. So this one, we have a whole YouTube video on this one, uh, but for tooling and fixturing, it does a fantastic job, and I think it would really, um, your shop would really enjoy having uh, a lot of fixtures that aren't so heavy. They're not so big and steel, and because there's, there's part numbers and everything on them, uh, they're super easy to find, but then also you can just remake them as needed. So that's one example of creating complex uh, fixtures. Another one is a, a clevis. Now, I actually am planning on building a clevis out of carbon fiber, and I want to see if I can do it, mostly because I want to see if I can replace a steel part specifically a steel part that you would never think to replace with plastic. How often do you think, well, that's, that part's just got to be too strong. It's got to be steel. There's just no way to do it with composite. So I picked a part that I thought, hey, this is a two-ton shackle with a half-inch diameter. If I could make this out of a composite part, there's not too many other designs that you're going to say, it's got to be structural uh, so we can't make it out of plastics. So approaching this part, if we look at this, let's first, when you're approaching a design that you've never done with composite, with additive manufacturing, I like to kind of reverse engineer how we got here. In this part, it's a forged part. 
which means it's being forged from some kind of a, a billet or raw material. Probably a piece of bar stock that's bent and then smashed at the, uh, the, the mounting location. It's round because of the operation. It's not round because it necessarily needs to be round, right? You can start to tease out what are manufacturing constraints and what are actual design criteria and requirements. And honestly, I think the round thing might be a design requirement, but I could test that theory. There's a couple other things. The orientation, right? We want to set the orientation and this is where I want my XY orientation to be, right here, where, where I can get a really nice uh, set of fiber reinforcement that goes all the way around this main clevis part. But then look here at the bottom of this guy. Right there, vertically, is going to be a Z-axis uh, uh, seam, right? And it's going to be in tension as it pulls. So what I've got to think about is, OK, how do I make this to where it'll fit on a flat surface? How do I make sure the stranded uh, uh, fiber gives me a nice, solid connection to my final thing? And I came up with this. This is like an early iteration. I'm not done yet. But here's an idea that I had, and I want to talk about why I took that design and turned it into this design. For the first thing, I, I made it square because who cares, right? I don't, I don't need... Uh, a rounded cross-sectional shape because of the forging requirements, the forging operation. So I squared it off for simplicity. I threw in a couple chamfers just because I thought that might help a little bit with uh, whatever other clevis or, or eyelet that this is going to be attached to. And then I started looking at down here, how am I going to transfer that fiber load down to the pins? And so I offset the pin. And by offsetting the pin, it gave me a nice solid sandwich here. So I'm going to basically build a, a fiber sandwich board here that's going to be super strong. And then that pin will sort of connect up to it. I made the pin not round. Again, why is the pin round? It's round because round bar stock's cheap and easy. So I made it not round and I'm going to make a 3D printed pin to go in here. And then I think this is actually, I did some FEA, I think this is unnecessary. But I love this idea of putting a bolt into an injection molded part. Now, the bolt doesn't actually bolt anything. It's just a bolt. You just stick a bolt in there in the Z direction. But the reason you do that is the same reason you put rebar and concrete. So with a 3D printed part that has a Z-axis tensile weakness, start thinking about other materials that have Z-axis or tensile weakness, concrete being the big one. You put rebar in it, and in some cases you post-stress or pre-stress the rebar so that the whole thing stays in compression. Well here, I'm just saying, hey, let's take two bolts, let's run them in there and tighten them up. All of a sudden now there is no more z-axis problem with strength. The z-axis tensile strength direction is actually really strong because we use these super cheap bolts to hold it in together. Now this one I'm actually looking at other ways to redesign it. Like I said I'm still early here but by kind of considering approaches and considering limitations but also new uh, possibilities with additive manufacturing you can kind of take some designs in some cool directions and create a really cool uh, approach to an old design. Uh, you know, you wouldn't do this for mainstream stuff. I mean, this is a $2, $3 shackle. Uh, you don't do this for mainstream stuff. You do this for, let's say, aircraft. You do this for uh, areas where you can't have sparks. You do this for areas where you can't have uh, metal, like around MRI machines, right? There's, there's lots of applications. Uh, where these kinds of things might need to happen. Uh, let's look at one more, actually two more. The next one is a switch. And this is one I actually built. So this is a shutter switch. That's a penny, by the way, just for reference. This thing is tiny. It's a tiny little box. And you kind of lose track of how small this thing is while you're in here in the 3D model. 
But when you go to build these, it's got to be the thickness of each part has to be a multiple of the layer thickness. And the walls have to be a multiple of the layer width. And anything you do is going to have to kind of use those constraints. So that's where that composite design guide uh, that Mark Forge puts out is so perfect. Because you can come in here and say, okay, I want to put in this hole. Does that meet my minimum hole requirements? Yes, no problem. What size wall thickness do I want around it? Great, no problem. And it kind of helps you to guide your design uh, efficiently. Now this one, this one bothered me. And I want to see if it bothers you too. I'm thinking about this from a plastic part design perspective, and I'm building this out, and I need this switch to go right here. The height is very critical, and I need extra space below for the wiring. Underneath this is this big, fat, thick block. And if this was an ejection molded part, that would create a major problem. I'd have to like do an undercut from underneath to hollow it out from the bottom or something, right? but it's sparse fill. So I can leave really big fat sections like this closed and I don't have to worry about anything. In fact, it's actually more efficient to do it that way and less material and less weight to leave it a big fat thick section right there than it would be to try to kind of hollow that out like you would with an injection molded part. And it ends up sort of saving you a lot of time with building this thing. A couple more things that I did, we show the lid. That switch required kind of a, a, a pin or a screw to hold it in place. What I did is I put in these, these posts, but these are in the z-axis. So a z-axis skinny tall post is going to be a problem. Mark Forge design guide said this is the ratio you want to stay under for it to work. This would have stayed under the ratio even if I had made it long and slender to the whole height. But by cutting it in half and doing half on each side, these are much shorter, much stiffer uh, uh, posts, much less likely to break off. Last thing I want to show on this is that I just used wood screws. Super cheap and simple. All I really wanted was to drop this thing in and throw some screws in to hold the lid on and close it up. And this, uh, this is the picture of the result up there in the top right. It was perfect. Right out of the gate, it did exactly what I needed it to do. And I was able to make it overnight, basically model it up in my hotel room. I was on site trying to do this. Model it up in my hotel room, sent it to the printer, and it was done in the morning. And then last one here. And if you guys have questions, go ahead and let me know. But um, for that part that we built in two pieces, right, because the, the orientation was critical in, in uh, two different areas of the part, we wanted to kind of slide in some captive hardware. So for a part like this, what you can do is build a, a cavity for that hardware. So if it's in the XY orientation with a Z axis, uh, you can create the hex. And if it's in the uh, XY orientation, you can drop in a square nut and, and make it like that. But the idea is give yourself about five thousandths clearance uh, around these parts so that you can slide them in, stick them into the part, and then resume the print. And it'll actually print right over top of this. And so it kind of encapsulates it fully inside. You wouldn't even know it's in there until you look down inside the hole and you see some metal threads poking out somewhere down in the middle. Now to further this discussion, let's say that this is maybe a counterbore or maybe this is a bolt that's holding it onto another part. What I would do is I would go into Iger and I would drop in a nice, solid, flat, fiber-reinforced layer right at the bottom of this uh, hex nut, and then one more right at the top. And then I would tell it to pause. So I would build this nice platform, then it would build this nice little cavity, then it would pause and I would drop my fastener in there, and then it would cap it off with a very structural part. And this part now has a threaded connection, the ability to be a threaded connection 
that's as strong as a steel part with threaded holes at it. I hope that you found this informative and useful. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with designing uh, or incorporating or moving things over to uh, additive manufacturing. And to me, these were the biggest ones that I felt were just hard to grasp, hard to understand, or hard to really incorporate into my designs. And the more I time I spend, the more I realize you're not going to accidentally see benefits in additive manufacturing. It's very unlikely that you'll be able to understand it until you understand how it's done or actually go through the process of building one. And so hopefully these examples help you to see how you would approach a design uh, with respect to additive manufacturing. And uh, uh, hope when you, the, the, the big takeaways, if you see a challenge, when you see a problem, when you see something, you're like, I just don't know how to do it, consider additive manufacturing. And you maybe need to reach out for those first few to the makers of the machines, show them your design challenge, and ask them if they've got anything cool or slick. Uh, and feel free to send anything to me as well. I'm, I'm happy to, to look at a design, look at a challenge, and say, have you thought about doing it this way? And once you can justify it the first time, you're not going to have any problem from there. Everybody that gets a printer says, oh my goodness, this is huge. We don't know how we got by without it, and we now need more for more capacity. It's really amazing to see it happen, but you got to get that first one out the door.